21st century, what will it be like? How will we choose to live in the next 34 years? We might fill our with furniture like this. Our beds, tables, and chairs all made of paper. Our home may be lighted by electricity from fuel cells and the wood and leather of stick. Our favorite easy chair might be inflatable, like a huge balloon. The kitchen of tomorrow could look more like a laboratory than a place to bake a cake. Advanced technology already has begun to find a place in the home. With new developments in food preservation, a meal might be stored for years and then cooked in seconds under a barrage of high-energy radio waves. Robots may help us with our housework. It's all possible in the home of the 21st century. Everyone dreams of a home somewhere, surrounded by natural beauty and a lot of land. Before the year 2001, 60 million new homes will be built. Some of these visionary homes of tomorrow exist today. This is what people dream about for the 21st century. What will be the reality? The search for a place to live in the 21st century already has begun. Today, people are pushing away from the crowded congestion of present-day cities and congesting the surrounding countryside. Many of them end up in homes like these at the ugly edges of urban sprawl. The search for a home nestled in nature often ends in the empty repetition and tasteless sterility of a suburban tract development. Instead of delighting in natural beauty, urban sprawl defiles it. The age-old American dream of a home away from it all could create a 21st century nightmare. What is the future of the single family home? Architect Philip Johnson. This idea that you should plop little houses around on tracks uh, will go, I think. There's no uh, it's a totally wrong use of land. Everybody has a little bit of lawn on four sides of his house. Nobody has any privacy. No one has a garden of their own. No one, no architect builds houses now. It's all done by, by builders and developers. And they uh, build them all alike, as you know. They call the ticky tacky houses in the song. But there's no future to that, because the cost of servicing uh, the house is growing by such leaps and bounds that the taxes on that house can nowhere near pay uh, for the services the town has to put there with the water, sewage, roads. So the house is a thing of the 20th century. If the individual house is a thing of the 20th century, the search for the home of tomorrow might end in enormous brick beehives like these. It has been projected that by the 21st century, 90% of the American population will make their homes in urban areas. Can we find a compromise between intelligent use of land and personal privacy? City planner, Constantinus Doxiadis. We forgot in the 20th century, and especially in this country, the necessity for privacy. I don't believe in picture windows, which allow people to inspect my house from outside. But I also believe in uh, squares, playgrounds, benches, statues out of my house, which will give me the chance to meet with my neighbors when I want. The Japanese have the smallest gardens in the world, but they are the most beautiful. And some of them are symbolic of the whole cosmos, of the whole world. A small pond, perhaps three feet square, replaces the sea, a rock replaces the mountain, and the open sky replaces or is there for the great cosmos. A very small tree means the forest. In this very small garden, we have the symbolism of the world, but the Japanese can retire in this garden and think and meditate. And this we have to give to ourselves. The Japanese home is an ancient solution to the problems of urban living. At Expo 67 in Montreal, Canada, a bold new experiment in housing is in progress. It is called Habitat 67. Habitat may be a prototype for the home of 2001. 
This unusual urban complex is a cluster of 354 of these concrete boxes, or modules. Together, these modules will make up 158 individual homes, each with a private garden and terrace. They are precast on the construction site and hoisted into place by giant cranes. The population density of this project will be 10 times greater than the average suburban tract, but much less than conventional high-rise apartments. Habitat's building block construction attempts to apply the efficiency of modern mass production to problems of urban living, combining economical use of land and imaginative design. Habitat's young Israeli architect Moshe Safdi. What Habitat tries to do is uh, build a high-density environment and still give uh, the family the kind of amenities which they go to the suburbs for, which they uh, go to a single-family house, uh, like privacy, like a garden, uh, like uh, fresh air and sunlight and view and uh, all the things people want in a house. So it's trying to preserve these amenities within a high-density, multi-story development. This is a single repetitive unit. Uh, which measures approximately 17 feet by 38 feet. And it's cast on the plant and pre-finished, and then the crane lifts it into place and interlocks it. And these units are load-bearing so that the forces go right through the units to the ground. Then one, two, or three of these make up houses so that this may be a house or that may be a house, and there is the garden there. And the cluster, the clusters which are formed by eight units along the street, have a common area of entrances and play, playgrounds on the other side. And then on the ground, you have the car level and you have the pedestrian level. Okay. And the pedestrian level bridges to the river and to the harbor, and the car level and the pedestrian level never cross. Probably less than half of the 60 million new 21st century homes will be one-family dwellings. This doesn't necessarily mean the end of the individual home. Many build a second home in the country. With electronic communications and high-speed transportation, time in large urban clusters, and then really get away from it all in a truly isolated, self-sufficient second home. No one knows where the search for the home of 2001 will ultimately end. We do know some of today's possibilities, like these luminescent panels. Let's push our imaginations ahead and visit the home of the 21st century. This could be someone's second home, hundreds of miles away from the nearest city. It consists of a cluster of prefabricated modules. This home is as self-sufficient as a space capsule. It recirculates its own water supply and draws all of its electricity from its own fuel cells. As we approach, it could be observed by an automatic closed circuit television system which would notify our hosts. Once inside, we might find ourselves in a glass enclosure where the lint and dirt we've accumulated during our trip is removed electrostatically. Now we step into the living room. What will the home of the 21st century look like inside? Well, I'm sitting in the living room of a mock-up of the home of the future, conceived by Philco Ford and designed by Paul McCobb. This is where the family of the 21st century would entertain guests. This room has just about everything one would want. A big, some might say too big, full-color 3D television screen, a stereo sound system that could fill the room with music, and comfortable furniture for relaxed conversation. Now, in the 21st century, you might bring your favorite chair along with you when you go for a visit. To do this, you wouldn't need a small trailer, just a little bag, like this. Now, there's a full-size chair in here, a chair that blows up like a balloon. Here's the way it looks after it's been fully inflated. When a guest arrives, he just pulls out his inflatable chair, a small pressurized air capsule would inflate it, then it would be ready for use. At the end of the evening, he'd just pull out the plug and put the deflated chair back into his little bag. Sounds preposterous, but some people are convinced it will happen. And here, here's another piece of furniture that might be found in the living room of the 21st century home. When you finish a little children's chair, just throw it away. It's made out of paper. In the 21st century living room, there's no reason we can't have something old and familiar in it to remind us that both the present and the future are really merely extensions of the past. 
Even before that chair was made, technology had begun to change our way of living. Technology is opening a new world of leisure time. One government report projects that by the year 2000, the United States have a 30-hour work week and month-long vacations as the rule. A lot of this new free time will be spent at home. And this console controls a full array of equipment to inform, instruct, and entertain the family of the future. The possibilities for the evening's program are called up on this screen. We could uh, watch a football game, or a movie shown in full color on our big 3D television screen. The sound would come from these globe-like speakers. Or with a push of a button, we could momentarily escape from our 21st century lives and fill the room with stereophonic music from another age. Everything in this home of the future has been designed for comfort. Today's air conditioners, for instance, are only the beginning. The home of the 21st century might have a completely controlled environment. For example, those wall panels can change themselves to darken a room or let in more light. They're controlled by this switchboard. Now this is where the family of the 21st century would relax. Over here is where work would be done. Now this is where a man might spend most of his time in the home of the 21st century. This equipment here will allow him to carry on normal business activities without ever going to an office away from home. This console provides a summary of news relayed by satellite from all over the world. Now, to get a newspaper copy for permanent reference, I just turn this button, and out it comes. When I've finished catching up on the news, I might uh, check the latest weather. This same screen can give me the latest report on the stocks I might own. A telephone is this instrument here, a mock-up of a possible future telephone. This would be the mouthpiece. Now, if I want to see the people I'm talking with, I just turn the button and there they are. Over here, as I work on this screen, I can keep in touch with other rooms of the house through a closed-circuit television system. With equipment like this in the home of the future, we may not have to go to work. The work would come to us. In the 21st century, it may be that no home will be complete without a computerized communications console. The domestication of the computer already has begun. In Phoenix, Arizona, the Charles Crawshaw family has learned to live with a computer terminal in their kitchen. This teletypewriter is connected by ordinary telephone lines to a computer complex in New York City, 2,400 miles away. Charles Crawshaw, a general electric engineer, works on technical problems. His wife, Barbara, uses the computer for various household chores. Here, the computer has expanded the proportions of a recipe for six into a recipe for 14. By the 21st century, home computers may be as common as today's telephones. What are you doing? Everybody. The children of the 21st century might be educated by a computer at home. The Crawshaw daughters do some of their homework this way today. Try 148. 148. One, two, eight. Tomorrow's home computer won't simply do old jobs in new ways. By the time the Crawshaw daughters have families of their own, we may have created jobs for computers that we haven't even dreamed of today. Even with a computer in her kitchen, Mrs. Crawshaw still cooks her family's meals. Cooking might be different in the 21st century. 
industrial designer Henry Dreyfus. I like to think that the art of baking a homemade pie won't be lost, but maybe the one that comes out of the supermarket is going to be better than the one that you can make at home because we've lost the art. Uh, I think that uh, packages for quick food, and this doesn't just have to be in the kitchen, the package might very well have a, a disposable electric plug as part of it. And you just plug this in, the package would heat, you'd eat the food, and you might even eat the package. All the wasted paper in the world, it's conceivable that when the package was heated, it would turn into part of the food. I think people like to eat, and um, I don't think really uh, that everybody's going to eat out of a deep freeze. I think that some people like to cook. I think we should take this away from them. For those who still enjoy cooking for themselves, the kitchen of the 21st century may offer many new ways to prepare a meal. Microwave cooking, for example. Microwaves are high-frequency electromagnetic waves, higher than the waves that carry normal radio signals, but lower than the frequencies we know as light. Microwaves vibrate energy, and food absorbs this energy as heat. Many materials, like the glass that surrounds a souffle, are unaffected by microwave energy. The glass remains cool while the food gets hot. The food is cooked all at once instead of having to absorb heat slowly from the outside. This souffle normally cooks in 40 minutes. With microwaves, it's ready in 90 seconds. This might be part of the kitchen in the home of the future. Preparation of a meal in the 21st century could be almost fully automatic. Frozen or irradiated foods are stored in that area over there. Meals in this kitchen of the future are programmed. The menus given to the automatic chef by a typewriter or punched computer cards. The proper pre-packaged ingredients are conveyed from the storage area and moved into this microwave oven where they are cooked in seconds. When the meal is done, the food comes out here. When my meal's ready, instead of reaching for a stack of plates, I just punch a button, and the right amount of cups and saucers are molded on the spot. When I've finished eating, there'll be no dishes to wash. The used plates will be melted down again, the leftovers destroyed in the process, and the melted plastic will be ready to be molded into clean plates when I need them next. In 2001, we might eat out in automated restaurants. Today, American Machine and Foundry has a system for automated drive-ins called Amfair. Press a button and the computerized kitchen cooks by itself. Robots are coming, not to rule the world, but to help around the house. In the home of 2001, machines like these may help cook your breakfast and serve it too. We may wake up each morning to the patter of little feet, robot feet. spoke with a professor who is experimenting with computerized robots at London's Queen Mary College, M.W. Thring. Professor Thring, what are these? These are the first prototypes of small-scale models of the domestic housemaid of the future. The domestic housemaid of the future? Yes, the maid of all work, to do all the routine work of the house, all the uninteresting jobs that the housework, housewife would prefer not to do. You also give it instructions about decisions, that it mustn't run over the baby and things like that, and then it remembers those instructions, and whenever you tell it to do that particular program, it does that program. What is the completed machine going to look like? Is it going to look like a human being? 
No, there's no reason at all why it should look like a human being. The only thing is it's got to live in a human house and work in a human house. So it's got to go through doors and climb up stairs and so on. But there's no other reason why it should look like a human being. For example, it can have three or four hands if it wants to. It can have eyes in its feet. It can be entirely different. It would have the full run of the house, and indeed the, these ones here are examples of machines that would actually walk upstairs. Just as the human being has the built-in sense of balance, we can build in a sense of balance into the machine so that the body part of it is always upright, even when the carriage is going up the stairs. Could the machine conceivably make a mistake and just uh, walk out of the house, go through the wrong door? It, it could. Uh, it's uh, very easy to allow for this, though, because you can have a large red button uh, conveniently placed so that anybody can punch this button and immediately immobilize the whole machine. So there's no need to be frightened of it. Does it uh, fold itself up, or are we going to have to provide it a room in the house? Uh, it would put itself away in a cupboard when it had finished, where it would also recharge its batteries. The 21st century home is still only a dream, as utopian and probably as unattainable for the average man as these far-out homes of today. comes a time when our dreams of the 21st century must be weighed against the realities of today. Architect Philip Johnson. Uh, we're talking about where you and I are going to live. And we're going to live in these, uh, in these mass-produced buildings. And just mass-producing little plop-plops or uh, adding a, a flexible type thing, do it yourself, isn't going to work. Now, what is going to work, an individual wants to be like Thoreau and go off to the main woods and get an ax and build your own house, that will go on for some centuries, perhaps. But that is no longer germane. What is interesting is the push to the city that's, that's as nothing but accelerates since Jefferson's time. And this is the strength to get around to another subject. This is the reason why it's so difficult to persuade the American people to do their cities over, is because we still believe in Jeffersonian uh, agrarian ideals. You spend all your day in a, in a labyrinth, you see, well, you're going to spend all night there, too. We're just going to make it as tolerable as we can. Can we find a compromise between our increasingly urban way of living and the pride and privacy of the individual home? These children will raise the families of the 21st century. They will live in homes with all the gadgetry of a new age. 3D television, automated cooking, and robot housemaids. But machines don't make a home. People do. A home, as Winston Churchill once observed, is more than just a living unit. It will take decisions that go beyond technology, decisions about the quality of the life we want to lead, to answer the question, how will we live in the 21st century? The 21st century was filmed and edited under the supervision and control of CBS News.